Nice Amen. to see you again. How's Aria? Thank you. All right, well, everyone, thank you so much for coming out here. It's so good to see so many people and to see so many familiar faces. It just really fills my heart. Um, those of you who know our story know that we started about a year ago. Actually, I think our one year anniversary is going to be next month, right? Started a little bar and a little pub in Santa Monica, yeah. and uh, <laughs> here we are today. So, um, and yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, we, we um, have monthly meetings, we create our own content, we're working on outreach and connecting. We have made a lot of incredible partnerships. Uh, Lucy, Collective Avenue Coffee, Lumio, a uh, worker co-op um, from New Zealand, who we have a workshop with next month. Um, they've led lots of different people along the way that we're thankful to build these connections with. Um, and we, we really we believe that cooperative um, forms of business are one of the ways in which we can address the many intersectional issues that are keeping so many people down today. And though often discredited, they are efficient as traditional company, as, as efficient as traditional companies, more productive, longer lasting. At the macro level, we consider them to be one of the ways in which we can alter the employer-employee relationship that so odiously links us all. And on the micro level, workers and cooperatives are on average less alienated, they're happier. And that's something we can get behind. So, hi everyone, my name is Andrea, and this is Oh, Liz sorry, my name is Kayla. Kayla. <laughs> I forgot that part. Did you say my name too? I think so, but that's okay. all right. But, uh, <laughs> so, we're the, the co-organizers of this event, and you know, we want to just take this moment to thank you all for coming. It's, it's really great to see everyone. And you've helped us you know, today, and we hope that you keep doing that like in the months that come in any capacity you can volunteer and so on you want to share your pictures of the day all that information is on there you know support us in any meaningful way would be great um, that being said we're going to get out of the way and we're going to give you you know the dessert the, the, the first course <laughs> and everything <laughs> <laughs> professor richard wolf yes So I, I've never been, before been compared to a piece of cake, but, uh, <laughs> but it's a new experience and I appreciate it. Uh, yes. Um, so, what? Good thing it wasn't a press from you. That's true, it's true, it's true. Um, I tried to think what I might say that would be of some uh, interest to all of you. So I, I came up with two things. So I'll do one and then the other. The first one is to tell you kind of what's happening in terms of how things look from New York City, where we are based. Um, and the second is about the strategy, the political strategy going forward that you might want to think about in terms of what you're going to do. So first about w what's happening. Um, we continue to be amazed in New York City um, with our own growth and with the growth of the audience for what we're doing. I won't pretend to understand why this is happening. I mean, I can say the things we can all say, the crash of 2008, the, the election of Trump, uh, Bernie, the Occupy, all, all those things, they're all, of course, relevant. But how they came together to produce this upswing, this upsurge of interest in what we have to say is still something we only half understand and half is being generous. And we need to understand it better to know how best to react. So it's not a minor matter to, to get this clear. But let me tell you sort of what uh, has begun uh, to happen. Um, first, I believe we're now up to 18 groups like this across the United States. I think it's 18. If you go to our website, you can see that. Uh, the latest one, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, Melbourne, Australia. I mean, it's just extraordinary. Groups like yours forming slowly, steadily around democracy at work, the critique of the status quo, capitalism, the system we have, and looking towards worker co-ops as a key part of where we go next, as a solution to the problems we have, or at least as an important part of the solution. 
Um, so we're amazed. We're amazed that these groups are happening, that all of those issues that kept people from getting together to do the kind of thing we're doing are somehow breaking down and people are getting together. Particularly here in the United States, you know, we have a, a history of at least half a century of people on the left being so afraid of getting together with other people in the same organization, having this visceral sense that that's not going to go well. <laughs> that either the police will bother you or you'll lose your job or your friends and neighbors will look at you as if you have some bad disease uh, that's catching, et cetera, et cetera. The instinct, don't do it. That is not blocking this. I don't know exactly why that's not happening the way it always did, but it isn't. And it, it isn't, as you can see, looking around the room here. It isn't. And it isn't in all these other places uh, as well. Uh, and now what's happening to me, since I'm still much more of the public face of this than I ought to be and than I want to be. This can't be a, an operation that's built as much as it still is around me. It's got to have more of you doing it, speaking, standing up, being the visible faces of all of this, going out and talking to groups. I know for some people, the notion of standing in front, I don't know how many were there last night, but so we had six or seven hundred people in that church. What? Bravo. Yeah, no, we had like a huge audience in that church. Beautiful church, and the basically filled, and the big uh, old church with stained glass windows. It was, a, it was a nice event last night. These events are now common for us. Six or seven hundred people, normal. Uh, I've had more. Um, and so, we need more people doing this, and we are actively looking. So those of you that think you might do this, and those of you that are afraid because, you know, it's a little daunting to get up in front of hundreds of people staring right at you. So if you put on the wrong outfit, mm, they're going to see. And if you stumble when you say something, they're going to be right there. It's just like riding a bicycle. After the fourth or fifth time, you don't even think about it anymore. You get up there, you explain what it is, and people are grateful for what you have to say, and they'll show it to you. you. Many of you have been very kind in the little minutes I've been here to come up and say something nice to me. It's wonderful. These are wonderful experiences. I'm just like you. Somebody come up and say thank you for what you do. I mean, you know, three people do it. It makes your day. Yeah. Um, and those things are available because for the first time in 50 years, <coughs> Something is going on on the left end of American politics that's at least as powerful as what's happening on the right wing. Everybody talks about the Tea Party and the Trump and, and all of that, and that's an important part of what's going on. I don't deny it for a minute. But at the other end, I can tell you from my own experience, at least as big a transformation is underway, and we don't yet have the candidate, although Bernie came close, to beginning to demonstrate that this is going on. Um, but we're going to get them. I don't know exactly who they'll be any more than anybody else, but the audience is there just waiting for people, and it could just as well be one of you as anybody else to emerge and be the kind of symbol. And I don't just mean one. We need a lot of people doing this, and you all ought to think about it. One of the ways you can grow as a group is to have yourselves out there. If there's a high school in the area that wants to hear about something, you send someone, and the fact that you don't know it all that well, this is how you're going to learn. Nothing makes you learn how to do this better than having to stand in front of a group of people and not make a fool out of yourself. The pressure on you when you go home getting ready, you'll get very nervous. You'll eat too much, 12 cupcakes. But, <laughs> but you know, while they're rolling around and reminding you about your weight problem, you will, uh, you will actually get yourself ready and you'll go out and do it. And if you stumble a few times, so what? So you'll stumble a few times. That's how you learn and you get better at it. You'll notice when people look at you funny that you just said the wrong thing. That's how everybody else learned how to do this. You'll learn it too. The important thing is that you do it because that's how you'll get good at it. And remember, you've thought about this more than the kids in the high school class. You've thought about it more than the people in the Rotary Club or in the church social uh, committee or whatever it is that you find as a way to go. 
And churches, by the way, are becoming very different than they've been. Mm -hmm. half, of my, half of my public appearances are now in churches. Mm -hmm. Protestant, Catholic, and uh, Jewish synagogue. All over the place. Uh, the ministers, the rabbis, the priests, and so on are changing. They're offended by Trump also in lots of complicated ways. They're shaken by what's being done to immigrants, and they're willing to begin to step up with a little bit of backbone they kind of had lost sight of. Uh, I'm being as careful as I can. Um, and so they are, they are allies. The union movement is in such terrible shape that they're desperate for allies, and, and they're increasingly open also, if not for reasons of solidarity ideologically, then just to not be as alone and as isolated and as in such a losing situation. It's very sad. But there's lots of good union people, and they have long histories, many of them, of, of struggle. To get them as allies would be very important for us, very, very important. And now is the time. I don't want to over-dramatize it, but having said that, of course, I will. Um, the, uh, for 50 years, really for the last 50 years since the Second World War, to be a leftist, a radical, a socialist, a Marxist, any of these words, meant you were weird, you were strange, you were ostracized from the community, you were looked at as if you were strange or crazy or disloyal to America, all those things. And what? And dangerous. Dangerous, all, all those kind of words, that's what you were. And so, and if you're considered like that, you, you, what are you going to do? You understand that people don't want to be looked at that way. What, what kind of life can you have? Your job is at risk. Your, your, your position in your church is at risk. Your position in the neighborhood is at risk. You don't want to do it. And we understood it. That's not true anymore. It isn't. I'm telling you, I went around the country in a way that probably none of you do. And I'm telling you, to my surprise, it's not the case anymore. But that implies that we don't have the excuse we had for 50 years not to get out there. We had a good excuse. It was very dangerous to get out there. It isn't now, so you don't have any excuse. If we don't do something now, it's on us. We are the ones now whose hesitance is going to kill it. Because of the freedom, to be crude about it, this government is now so busy trying to solve the problems of a system that's falling apart, which it can't do, that it's distracted. It's not bothering us. <laughs> it thinks its big problems are in places like North Korea, <laughs> which its Navy can't find. <laughs> You all got that last week, right? <laughs> it's over here, and the Navy was over there. And nobody understood where any of these places were, since we have officials who can't spell North Korea. Um, they're worried about North Korea. They're worried about Syria. They're worried about Muslims. And they're worried about immigrants. They're not worried about us. That's very important. We have a level of freedom, we have a level of opportunity, would be a tragedy, and on us, if we miss it. And it's a real window. I didn't think it was going to last. I didn't think it when everything started changing, as I mentioned to one of you a few minutes ago. Changing for me, but therefore also for you. I've been saying things critical of capitalism most of my adult life. This is not, I didn't have some epiphany last week that made me shift. I've been doing this a long time. But it's only in the last five years that suddenly this becomes popular. This becomes interesting to all kinds of people who heard me before and weren't interested at all. They were scared, it was dangerous, it was somehow frightening. They don't think that anymore. They just don't. They're excited. And I thought, this can't last. This is so abnormal. This is so different. But it's now six years, and not only is it continuing, it's getting better. I now turn away three out of four invitations I get because I can't do it. I can't physically be all these places. I'm here for three days. You know, I don't like this. Sitting on an American airplane is like being the sardine in the can. 
Uh, it's no fun at all. They've managed to destroy that as an experience. Used to be exciting, now it's a major drag. Unless you fly a business class, and unfortunately we don't have enough money for that. Um, so I don't like doing it, but I can't turn that, this down. I did that last night to six or 700 people. I'm talking to you today. I talk at Occidental College this evening. Tomorrow I go to a conference at UC Riverside, and on and on. I could be doing this all day, every day, year round, in terms of the opportunities. They're just there. <clears throat> everybody knows, I'm going to go out on a limb, but everybody knows. In the, there's that wonderful song, Leonard Cohen. I don't know if any yeah. of you remember it. Everybody knows. If you ever get a chance to hear, and just Google it, you can hear it on the internet. Listen to Leonard Cohen's song, Everybody Knows, because it's about this. It's about other things too, but it's about this. Everybody knows there's something big not working in this society. That's why we elected Trump, because everybody kind of knows. They don't know what to do about it, but they know there's something terribly wrong. And whatever that is, it's not going to be fixed by Mr. Trump. He's busy making more money. Uh, he'll do fine at that, and then he'll be done, and the next one will come in. So it's our chance. Everything is creating for us opportunities like we've never had before. And in some ways, we have to thank Mr. Trump, much as that might be difficult for all of you, because right now, He's the best organizer we have. <laughs> he is. He's agitating one community after another. He's forcing people to have arguments with one another, to de clarify their opinions, to understand what they care about, to be clearer than they were before about the folks that are with them and the folks that are at least not yet with them. That's very helpful to us. All kinds of ways that's helpful to us. I can see it in the people who explained to me why they invited me to come somewhere. So let me tell you a story about one of them. I spoke a few weeks ago at um, Sonoma State College up in Rohnert Park, California. It's, I don't know, about an hour or so north of San Francisco. Very nice place, fancy campus, a lot of new buildings. Very nice. They were very kind and they invited me to be whatever it was, scholar of the month or whatever it was. Um, about to think of the old playmate of the month, but it wasn't that. Um, I, kept all my, I kept all my clothes on. Um, they were very kind, very friendly, and, and when I spoke a couple months before I went out there uh, to the president who handled inviting me, the president of the university, uh, she explained to me why they invited me. She said, well, we've had our students here learn in many of their courses about, you know, the good things about capitalism. and It's about time they heard the other perspective. You, would you please come and present a criticism of capitalism? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. <laughs> I made the poor woman repeat it, <laughs> which she very obligingly did. And she meant it. And when I went there, that's what I did, and that's what I was asked to do. Because, but take that, that's a sign, folks, of a lot of things yes. that she was comfortable as the president of a, a branch of the system to think like that and to f reach out to someone like me to come there and present to the students, and we had a very good meeting with hundreds of students in a huge auditorium who had a dose of criticism of capitalism. I'm happy to tell you nobody died. <laughs> Everybody survived. And we had a very good conversation, and the Q&A lasted as long as it lasted last night until the custodian made us leave uh, because the interest was all there. So. A year ago, I did the same thing at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, Kentucky. Think about that. And I do, yeah, I do that a lot. One of the best stations for the radio program that you get here on KPFK is in Tampa, Sarasota, Clearwater, Florida. WMNF, very important radio station, by the way. Been an independent, progressive radio station for 30 years huge audience. 
And I love going down there because part of me can't get over that I'm sitting in St. Petersburg, Florida <laughs> with hundreds of people uh, cheering on a critique of capitalism uh, who listen to it every week. So this is an extraordinary um, period of our, of our history. June 8th, uh, just pick another one. June 8th is a conference in Frankfurt, Germany. Because all over Europe, like in the United States, political actors on the left are gathering around the notion of the sanctuary city. The notion that it is the job of all the different parts of the left to begin thinking in terms of an alliance which begins in the protection and solidarity with immigrant communities that are being targeted as scapegoats for the problems of the societies which brought them in, after all. And that the rest of the left can find its way to ally with this effort and to ask in return, without he hesitance or shame, that the immigrant communities that they're helping also help them when they need help from the immigrant community for their labor struggles, for their struggles, to, to ask for support in building worker co-op, all of that. And so they've invited me, so I'm going to Frankfurt, Germany. Um, German is my first language, for those of you who don't know, so it's a chance for me to speak my mother tongue. Uh, so I like to do it anyway, but uh, this is a chance to go and, and to talk about how the United States is also in its way part of that. So let me turn, that's a nice segue, to the strategic imagery. Um, here's and this is just speculation, but it's a speculation whose logic you'll, you'll see. How could we grow conceptually as a political movement in this country? I think it would look, well, my guess is it's going to look something like this that our goal is to create in the United States a worker co-op sector of the economy, that a large part of the cities and towns, the states, the country, is going to see a transition from top-down hierarchical capitalist enterprises into worker co-ops, for all the reasons that you already know about and that we are championing. In order for this to happen, and it's already underway, but in order for this to happen in an organized way, we need not only to start co-ops and to help in the conversion of businesses that are organized as capitalist enterprises into worker co-ops, and all of that's already happening and it will happen more, but in order to facilitate that, in order to build that as a political movement, this transition, this growth of worker co-ops needs to have a political arm. It needs to have a political party. What would that party be and do? It would be the advocate of the worker co-op at the level of the government, whether that's the city or the state or the federal government. Its job would be to say, we are the political representatives of the desire, of the demand, for there to be a worker co-op sector of the economy so that all Americans can choose whether to buy their products from a capitalist enterprise or a worker co-op. Just like today, you can choose to buy something made in Bangladesh or maybe made in Paraguay or all those kinds of things. Now you're going to have a choice do you want your dollar of expenditure for a blouse or a software program to be a dollar that supports a worker co-op kind of enterprise or a capitalist? That's just as important as having a blue shirt or a yellow shirt. You're expressing a notion about what the community ought to be like, which you have the right to do. Well, you only have that right if there is such a sector. Otherwise. You don't have that right today because except for places like collective, what is it? Collective collective Avenue Coffee. There we go. Um, unless you have such an option, and that option has to be everywhere, you don't have that freedom of choice. 
And ditto, this is the way this party would articulate itself, Americans should have the freedom of choice where to work. You want to work in a top-down, hierarchical, non-democratic institution? Or do you want to work in a democratically run worker co-op? In order for you to have the freedom of choice where to work, there has to be a sector so you can choose whether you want to or not. So we would be a political party that's in favor of freedom of choice. That along with baseball and apple pie makes us Americans, right? We want freedom of choice. What would this party do? It would push for every conceivable governmental advantage that worker co-ops could want. Let me give you some examples. A law that makes it easy to set up such a business. Such laws already exist or in embryo in various American states, including here in California, but in others as well. We want all that developed to be a generally known code, to let people know how easily they can go through the steps of setting up a worker co-op or converting from a capitalist to a worker co-op business. That's one thing we want. Here's some other things we want, so let's be expansive. We want courses in high schools and colleges about how to organize a worker co-op. The Mondragon University already has all of those courses, and they have all the reading lists, and they're all in English. So it wouldn't take us very long to set up a program, maybe 10 minutes. So, but we should, we should require that. We should require that young people begin to know that's an option. You can set up a business this way. And the course should be elementary at a high school level and developed in college and be part of the curriculum of every business school. Yes, yeah, right. we wouldn't call it that for obvious reasons. Good idea, but branding needs a little tweaking. Yes, right. Um, but let, let's go a little further. Let's use the sample of the something in America that's been around a long time called the Small Business Administration. Some of you may know the SBA. Been around a long time, and by the way, reflect a very similar political history. The awareness of small businesses in America, 100 years ago, that they were getting screwed in the market by big businesses who can cut a better deal with a lawyer, a better deal with the bank, a better deal. And so small businesses is, were, were being squeezed out by big businesses who took advantage of their bigness. So they developed the idea the government should, here we go, level the playing field, football metaphor, right? hard if you're running uphill and trying to get the touchdown is difficult so you want it level so the small business administration was to do what arrange low interest loans for little businesses so they could get a lower interest loan without being defeated by a big bank which you can always cut a better deal with a bigger corporation that can cut a better deal with a bank so now you get a, a, a cheap loan than you otherwise would and that the government would commit for example, in Europe, this is very common, that the government commits that at least 20% or 40% of its purchases are, have to be made from companies with less than 50 employees so that the government, as a massive buyer, isn't always privileging the biggest company, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we have a wonderful menu. It's all there. We want all of that for worker co-ops. Yeah. And why? Same argument. If there should be small as well as big business, both capitalist, well, there should be worker co-ops as well as capitalist business for the same kinds of reasoning. We can just borrow the language, change a few words, we're all home free. And the precedent is there. If you want more precedent, minority business administration, women business, admi we have all that already. We're just asking for the co-op to get the same respect, the same governmental support. And then the big punch. Government has been subsidizing and benefiting capitalist enterprises for the history of the United States. And they have two political parties that do their work for them, don't they? One is called Republican and one is called Democrat. And they compete with one another to get tax breaks, What's Mr. Trump doing? He's working right now to lower the corporate tax rate from 35% to 20%. That's his major priority right now. You know what that is? That's a big subsidy for capitalist enterprises. All we're asking is we want 
to catch up. We have 300 years to catch up on. We want lots of tax relief and lots of subsidies in order to do for the worker co-op sector what you've already been doing for the capitalist sector and never made available to worker co-ops in any kind of systematic way. This would be the political arm of the worker co-ops. Every worker co-op would have a vested interest in supporting such a political party because what that political party did was to get the government supports that helped that corporate uh, worker co-op to survive. So where would the support of the party come? from the worker co-op. They'd have every reason to fund it, to support it, to get its members to become the base of such a political party, the people who become the emissaries, the missionaries, the explainers to the larger community of what they're doing, not just doing in their little coffee business or their little uh, home cleaning business or their little software shop, but as part of a social project to move a society from the capitalist nature that it has had to one that is more cooperative, one that is more collective. What, hmm, yeah. now we have a vision for a new society. We are not just a party that supports a particular kind of business. Yes, that's where we come from, but we have a vision of a new society that everybody will benefit from. That's what you need to build a political party. That's what the left has said it needed to shape up to. It needed to find a vision that would organize, motivate, and unify it. Well, that's it. That's a recipe for a transformation. It's a justification for a new political party because it makes it crystal clear what it's there for. No mystery. And this has got nothing to do with the policies about North Korea or East Overshoe. This is about the United States and the transformation of this society to solve its problems in a better way than has been achieved until now. And this is the political party that can do that. And it can reach out from such a base to all the other potential components of a transformative project in America. Immigrants, women, ethnic minority, you name it. All of them become allies, and they're allies who will want to ally because their support for more worker co-ops doesn't violate anything they're interested in, and they get friends. Friends which in all of their struggles will be very happy to have, whether it be to protect the immigrant or to get gender equality or to get racial integration and equality. All those issues which we'll, we will embrace will be now we, the worker community co cooperatives, will be coming to these other communities saying, we're not here out of guilt and we're, not, we're here to make a deal. We are going to help you with the issues that motivate you. You help us with this worker co-op movement and together we're going to change this country. That'll excite people, it'll motivate people, it will get the juices flowing and compare that to the offer made by the organizer of the Republican and Democratic Party. It'll be easy. This is 50 times more exciting, more inspiring, has more potential to make your life better than anything they offer. And it's not about this or that candidate or none of that. The candidates should be everywhere. They should be all you, all the people that are working in worker co-ops or near them or interested in them if they're not yet ready to form them. We don't care the order. It can be first a worker co-op, then such a party. Or maybe first such a party, then help build worker co-ops, or any mix and match, it doesn't really matter if the, if the understanding is clear. Now, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I understand it's hard enough to have a group like this function. It's hard enough to form a worker co-op. And those are hard, long, difficult things. 
On the other hand, you'll do the particular task with much more energy and much more effectiveness if you have a vision, a sense of where you're going, a larger product project that's exciting that you can explain to your sister or your cousin or your neighbor who will want to know why you're going to all those meetings. Are you in AA or what's it, what's going on yeah. here, right? You have to explain yourself. I don't mean to put any negative on AA. Last, as I said last night to some of you, it's, it's a model, not a, a model of what we can replicate if we were so strong as to be able to do what AA did. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but I want you to understand that you're getting involved in something here, and I don't know whether it'll succeed. No one should misunderstand me. I'm not saying we're launched, we're going to get, uh, none of that, I can't do that. That kind of cheerleading you needed somebody else for. But that what I just sketched out for you, that that's possible, that's clear to us now. It's possible. Whether we can achieve it, uh, we'll see. But that's kind of where things are leading us as much as we're leading them. And I'm excited beyond words that the, we're talking about the potential to finally change the United States in fundamental ways that we've dreamed about and fantasized about and imagined, but are becoming possible. And that doesn't happen very often in a society's history and we really need to grab it before it disappears on us, which it might, and which the people who want to keep this society from changing will be working to make sure. And they have impressive resources at their disposal. We should make no mistake about that. But now I can say, excuse me, for the first time in our lives, we also have some resources. This is a vision and an image and these are meetings that are real, and we have them now in the 18 cities, and the audiences we have are, we're now in a position to say, we have some resources that are emerging here too. And we have a more interesting and exciting vision of where this can go than the people who are trying to keep the lid on this society. What they can offer, not so good. They just gave us Mr. Trump, not too impressive. And the people he ran against, that's why they lost. They're even less impressive. <laughs> so our competition is in deep trouble. And we're rising, and they're not. And that's, uh, that's a precious, precious thing. So that's where my head is these days. Um, one, one personal note, because some of you have asked. You've been very kind. You've said, you know, thank you for coming out here. You're very welcome. But I want to say, as I sometimes do, I am having the time of my life. I love this. I never dreamed I would see this in my lifetime. I always knew that capitalism was heading for a fall and that the fall would be difficult, especially in this country, even more than in others, because it's got such illusions about itself and its economic system. So I knew it would be hard here. But I didn't think, you know, I just. The luck of the draw when my parents decided to have children wouldn't work for me. I wouldn't see it. So I am seeing way more than I thought I could. Things are becoming possible that I never thought. You know, last night, standing in front of six or seven hundred people who had paid money, good money, to come and sit in that church and spend a couple hours talking about the collapse of, of capitalism and where we go from here. That's an amazing thing to have happened. Five years ago, that was unthinkable. It just was. Even the people who, like Howard Zinn, who appeared in that same church some years ago, I was told last night, you know, he, I knew him, he knew he had to be very careful about what he said, as we all did. We all had to come up with clever ways of dancing around what we had to say which is why the name you proposed a few minutes ago had to be pushed aside a bit. Don't take it personally. I don't have to, I don't have to dance around the words anymore. I just don't. As you'll see if some of you come to the event tonight at Occidental, it's even now possible to take on socialism, communism, right on. And I will do that tonight. 
And I think you'll see that it'll be done in a way that doesn't scare people, doesn't make them feel we're in dangerous territory. It gives them a way to understand what those things were and how what we're doing borrows from, but also differs from that in a way that is understandable and rep representable to other people in a way that will not, will not, not only not scare them, but will actually draw them in. This is an amazing time, uh, and I just hope that we can all squeeze this for all the wonderful juice that can come out for us all, and that it will be an amazing ride in the next few years if we can build on it and keep it going. So let me stop and whatever you want to say.